But if you keep cutting the triangle up infinitely many times, and the trapezoid area only goes down a little, how does the limit approach a finite number? Well, yeah. So uh, I wish I, I really wish I had a board or something to illustrate this. But yeah, this was the first barrier that Aristotle came with. He realized that if he kept cutting this down infinitely many times, he would get infinite parts, and he knew he couldn't squeeze infinite parts into a finite box. So, I mean, what could he do? There's no calculus at that time, so you can't really show any limits. There's barely, I mean, any operations at all. There's no trigonometry. So the only thing he could do is show that infinitely many shrinking areas is the same as a finite area. And you're actually onto something here because if you have something that stays the same, if you have, for example, one, and you keep adding one to itself over and over, no, it's not going to approach a finite limit. It's going to diverge. The key to Aristotle's realization was that the areas went down. They didn't just go down, but they went down exponentially. 3 sixteenths is 1 fourth of 3 fourths. And 3 sixty fourths is 1 fourth of 3 sixteenths and so on. And that exponential decay is the only reason that actually summed up to a finite number instead of diverging. Yeah, I think so. What have mathematicians said about this over history? Well, let's fast forward all the way back to 450 BCE, when Zeno of Alea, one of the most famous philosophers of the era, came up with the first answer to this question. He imagined, well, he asked us to imagine the following situation. The fastest runner of the time, in his age, Achilles, the mythical athlete, meets a talking turtle. And they agree to race each other. But out of pity, Achilles gives the turtle a head start of one step. Who wins the race? Well, Zeno says, obviously, Achilles should win the race. But wait a second. Achilles gives the tortoise a one-step head start, so Achilles takes that first step to catch up with the tortoise. But he's mortified to find out that by the point he reaches the tortoise, or where it was when he started, the tortoise has already moved a little bit. And so he has to adjust to move to the tortoise's new position. He moves a little bit more to catch up with the tortoise. But he is shocked to find the tortoise has foiled him again, as the tortoise has moved while he was trying to catch up with it. So he tries catching up with it a third time, but the tortoise keeps moving a little bit more. And so Zeno reasons, Achilles has to catch up with the tortoise infinitely many times. And infinitely many times, infinitely many pieces obviously have to sum up to an infinite amount. In other words, Achilles can never catch up to the tortoise, even though he gave it barely one step of a head start. But Zeno knew that this was not true. He obviously knew that Achilles would win in real life. And so he concluded that something has to be wrong with his argument. But what? Well, the only logical oops, the only logical leap in his argument was that infinitely many parts must sum up to an infinite amount. So that part must not be true. But how? At that time, this was seemingly paradoxical. Remember, this is too 1,100 years before calculus was invented. And so he gave it the name Zeno's Paradox. Let's fast forward 200 years, still in ancient Greece, and Zeno of Alea is now long gone. But in his place is one of the most famous mathematicians of all time, Archimedes. Here's what Archimedes does. He draws a triangle, an equilateral triangle, and tries to cut it up into four smaller equilateral triangles. Each of the smaller ones had area one fourth, since it's four equal parts. The trapezoid must have had area three fourths. So now he takes a look at the top triangle and he cuts it up into four equal parts again. Since it's still an equilateral triangle, we can do the same thing, just the area is cut in one fourth. So he cuts it up into four equal pieces again and removes the oh my god and removes the top triangle again. And so what he's left with is three equilateral triangles, each with area 1 16th. Sum them up, you get a trapezoid with area 3 16th. Three then he takes the top triangle again and repeats the process. 
This time he gets a trapezoid with area 364. And he repeats the process over and over, and he figures out that a triangle can actually be broken down to infinitely many trapezoids. Now this triangle with area 1 must be equal to the area of all those trapezoids. 3 fourths plus 3 sixteenths plus 3 sixty-fourths plus 3 256 plus 3 1024 so on and so forth, forever and ever. Archimedes had just discovered that somehow an infinite sum, infinite parts, could be put into a finite box. He had just discovered the first identity of that form. Actually, he did it with squares, not triangles, but that's a little bit harder to visualize. So now we have the first infinite sum, around 250 BC. But through thousands and thousands of years, while infinite sums got some attention in that, for example, things like trigonometric functions were defined through infinite series, or, for example, the harmonic series, 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth, and so on, were proved to not sum up to a finite amount. They would just keep increasing forever. Infinite sums got surprisingly little attention compared to other areas of mathematics through those interceding years between Archimedes and one of the most legendary names in the history of math, possibly the most legendary, Leonard Euler. Euler seek to modify the harmonic series. He said, well, the harmonic series is 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, so on and so forth. You keep increasing the denominators by 1. Pretty simple. But what happens if I raise every single term there to some power, let's say s? If that power is greater than 1, since every term in the harmonic series is less than 1, that should make the sum go down. Maybe if he raised each term to a power and summed them up again, he would get something finite. So he tested that theory. And when he summed up 1 plus 1 half squared plus 1 third squared plus 1 fourth squared and so on, he got something finite. Something very peculiar, actually. Not just any finite number, not just any irrational number. Pi squared divided by 6. Now, this seemed to come out of nowhere. He titled this the zeta function, and later, the zeta function seemed to have no use at the start. But about 100 years later, in 1859, another legendary name in math, Bernard Riemann, gave it possibly one of the most useful purposes in mathematics. He showed a connection between the values and zeros of the zeta function and the prime density. That is, how many primes there are below a certain number on the real line. Now, this was a very far-fetched connection. And, you know, Euler was long dead. So Euler must have been thinking at that point when he was writing all of this about the zeta function. What is this ever going to be used for? Why am I doing this? Am I wasting my time? So now, let's fast forward 300 more years to when I started working on my research paper. Now, this research paper is about showing that three different nested sums are equal to three other different nested sums through the zeta function. Now, here's the problem with nested sums, which is the sum of a sum of a sum, three sigmas next to each other. The problem with that is those barely ever appear in any area of mathematics. And so when I started, I looked at this and said, Okay, well, this is nice, but what's the conclusion of this paper? If I had to summarize this to, you know, the peer reviewers of the journal that I wanted to submit this to, what am I even going to tell them? Aren't they going to laugh in my face and say, well, this is useless. We barely ever see two nested sums together, showing that three nested sums that have never even been seen before and are so convoluted that they will likely never appear anywhere else are equal to each other, well, what's even the use for that? Sometimes things can get very dark. Sometimes you start thinking, why am I even doing my own research? Will this ever get a use in the future? But you have to remember that the great minds of the past centuries and the past millennia, especially people like Euler, who produced dozens of papers even every single year, 
they inevitably came across some papers that were useless at the time, useless when he died, and even some papers which are still useless today. But the great thing about math, and all sciences generally, is that one day someone somewhere will find a use for something you do. And no matter if you get three citations in the first 10 years of your research paper being published, and you publish it in the lowest journal imaginable, it's still research. It's a contribution to the body of human knowledge. And you know, almost nobody does that. It's one of the most monumental achievements anyone can aspire towards. So no matter if you think your research paper is the greatest thing since sliced bread, or it's absolutely useless and no one will cite it, and no one will even see it, no journal will accept it, still remember it's a contribution towards science, which most people don't even like science. Some people learn science, but they don't actually contribute to it because they need it for another field outside of it. So you are part of a very, very small group who has actually dedicated their time, months, years, even their life to actual research actually helping humanity. Remember that fact whenever you're sitting down with your advisor and saying, well, what are we actually here for? Should I just scrap my paper and come up with a new idea? What is anyone going to cite this for? Because at the end of the day, research is for advancing humanity. Every little bit counts. Remember that. Thanks.